Lisa Wiseman. Uh, Mrs. Wiseman, my name is Ed Bernstadt. I'm an attorney. I called your office last night. Oh, that's you. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I just got into work. I'm filing a class action lawsuit, and from the research I've done, you qualify as one of the plaintiffs as part of the class. And if we prevail, you stand to collect a substantial amount of money in damages. Damages? Uh, what for? Well, it's a, it's a class action suit against Espotec Industries. They manufacture respirators, among other things, and a flaw has come to light in one of their portable models. The kind often used in ambulances. Now, so far, I've identified 27 patients who have either died or suffered irreparable brain damage as a result of insufficient oxygen intake due to this problem. Okay. So... Well, I don't want to be insensitive, but I think your husband's treatment just before he passed away might very well qualify him, which is to say you, to participate in our suit. My husband? Yes, ma'am. Um, Mr. Bernstead, my husband was killed by a subway train. He, he died upon impact. Oh, he, he, um, uh, never used any respirator because he never made it to an ambulance. Well, uh, forgive me, but, uh, that's not what these papers indicate. Well, I don't know anything about your papers, but my husband died instantly. Okay. Well, that's just not true, Mrs. Wiseman. Look, I don't mean to upset you, and I don't want to be morbid, but death is indicated by an absence of brainwave activity. And at the very least, I can assure you, your husband was experiencing brainwave activity when he arrived at the hospital. Mrs. Wiseman? One last time, my husband never made it to the hospital. My husband never made it to an ambulance. So there is really nothing for us to talk about, okay? And I really want to get back to work now. Good afternoon, Mrs. Wiseman. Yes. My name is Ed Bernstadt. We spoke the other day. That's right. Look, you're on private property, which means I'm going into my house and I'm calling the police. You don't have to do that. I'm asking you to leave. And I'm just asking you to listen. Has it occurred to you that maybe the reason you were told your husband didn't survive that accident is because someone is trying to cover up something that went wrong immediately after the accident? Look, I'm going to say this for the last time. I'm not interested in what ifs or theories. I am certainly not interested in revisiting that. And I am completely not interested in suing anybody. So if you don't mind. Oh, hell, if, if you're not interested. No. Of course, most of the people I represent in this case lost everything. They don't have the luxury of not being interested. Uh. I'd appreciate you thinking about that as you step inside your beautiful home. All right. You have five minutes. As you can see, the ambulance records confirm that he was on life support when he arrived at the hospital at 8.07. Where did you get this? Why don't you have me this? We have to request them. I mean, most people never do because they assume what they're told is the truth. I, I just don't understand. This isn't what they told me. And this isn't what the death certificate says. Why would they lie to me? To put it bluntly, to cover their behinds. It's better to say he died at an accident scene than to admit he died under their care. So if he did die in the hospital, why would they tell me that there were no remains to speak of? Well, again, I'm just hazarding a guess, but maybe so no one could perform an autopsy. So what are you saying? 
You're, you're saying that I, I was knowingly denied my husband's remains? That, that, that someone, a human being, did that? Well, I'm, I'm just following a paper trail, Mrs. Wiseman. Who would do that? Well, um, well, um, here we go. He was released to a doctor, Theodore Morris. I think I know this man. Yeah, yeah, please. She'll be right with you. Mrs. Wiseman, Ed Bernstead here. Good morning, Mr. Bernstead. Good morning. I'm sorry to bother you with work again, but I've been doing some checking up on that Dr. Morris, and I wonder if I could persuade you to give him a call. Well, you don't have to. Dr. Morris stopped by my house yesterday. Really? I hear he certainly makes an impression. Well, you, you could say that, yes. <laughs> Look, Mr. Bernstead, I really do wish you well with your work, but Dr. Morris simply confirmed to me what I already knew. I could not possibly participate in your lawsuit. My husband was very much expired by the time he reached the hospital. Really? Really? And, you know, Dr. Morris was, was, was really very nice. He was, he was actually comforting in his own way. And I really wouldn't want to make any trouble for him unnecessarily. I mean, <laughs> when he came to the door, at first I, I thought he was a Hare Krishna or something. Really, why would you think that? Well, you know, the, the bald head and everything. Are we talking about the same guy? According to the nurse I spoke to, this Dr. Morris was a tall African-American gentleman with a deep voice, glasses, and a goatee. 